Um, so today we are going to start uniting electricity and magnetism. Um, we've already kind of seen some hints here and there about the fact that they may be uh, somewhat connected. And it is going to turn out that there's really only one field, the electromagnetic field, and whether you see it manifested as an electric field or as a magnetic field is really just a matter of your perspective. So one person might see an electric field, another person might see an electric and magnetic field, one might see a magnetic field. It just depends on how you're looking. Now, we already pointed this out when we originally introduced the idea of um, a charge makes an electric field, but a moving charge also makes a magnetic field. So there, it seems to be that it's just a matter of perspective. And one of the ways we got around that was by saying, well, the thing that we normally look at making magnetic fields is current, because current is kind of like having our cake and eating it too. It's moving charge, so we can make a magnetic field, but wires usually have a net charge overall of zero because the moving charge has accompanied with it a, a, a equal and opposite uh, a, other charge. So we can say that for wires, we don't care about their electric field because there's no electric field, but it does make a magnetic field. Um, so we're going to delve into that further today and actually make this connection. And let me remind you that the big difference between what we could see electric fields and magnetic fields doing is that an electric field can accelerate a charge from rest. So an electric field has no problems taking a stationary charge and making it go faster. <clears throat> what we say if we want to be fancy is that the electric field can do work. So it can change the kinetic energy of a particle. That's just a fa fancy way of saying it can change its speed. Whereas what we've seen in the magnetic field, we've made a big point about saying it's deflective only. If the charge is already moving, it can deflect it into a circle or a helix, but it can't make it go faster or slower than it was going before. It can just change the path. The magnetic force plays its role of a guiding force. If you want to be fancy, you can say that the work done by the magnetic field is zero. It does no work. It can't change the kinetic energy of motion. So it can deflect it but it can't make it go faster or slower. So now what I'd like to do is show you kind of the classic uh, thought experiment where I show you how intimate a connection these two things have to each other. And um, it's not going to just be a theoretical thing on the board. I actually have the apparatus here with me so I can show you in person that it really does work as advertised. So here's my situation. I'm going to take a bar magnet. And I'm going to take a conducting ring. That conducting ring is not made out of any kind of magnetic material. The only thing it, that has to do is be an electrical conductor. And so my first scenario, I'm going to suppose that both the magnet and ring are at rest as far as my opinion is concerned, relative to me. I'll draw a subset of the magnetic field that is made by the bar magnet. I'm not going to draw the full loops. We, of course, talked about the fact that magnetic field lines always form closed loops. But I don't need to draw the magnetic field everywhere because I'm really just concerned about the bar magnet's effect on the ring. So I'm going to draw the relevant portion of the magnetic field of the bar magnet where the ring actually is. Okay. So what we see if this is a conducting ring, there will be charge carriers inside it. They're, of course, really electrons, but we, of course, typically, just for convenience, think of them as positive charges. So there will be three positive charges inside that ring, just waiting for some kind of thing to do. Now, in this case, will they do anything? will not. The, char <coughs> the charges in the ring are at rest with respect to us. 
And what we've learned, of course, <clears throat> is that if you're at rest, a magnetic field can't pick you up and make you go faster. It's deflective only. So the charges <coughs> that are in the ring stay at rest. So nothing happens. If the charges were already moving, then the magnetic field could deflect them into a circle, a helix, or whatever, but they're not moving at all. So nothing happens. So you can't just hold a magnet next to a conducting ring and expect something to happen in the ring. We're going to have to create some motion. So let's do that. So what I'm going to do in this case is I'm going to create the motion by moving the ring toward the magnet. I'm going to keep the magnet at rest. It's the ring that's going to be moving. So I basically set same, same perspective here something like this. And let's re examine. So now I have a charge here. Let's put a charge here. And by virtue of the fact that I'm moving the entire conducting ring, that of course means that I'm taking all of the charge carriers that are in it and moving them in the magnetic field. So now we have some motion that the magnetic field can do something about. So now we can have the charges be deflected. So now that they have some pre-existing motion, there can be some kind of deflection of them. So let's employ the right hand rule. This is definitely going to be awkward, long slaps. But I'll show you a much, much easier shortcut to do this, probably even a little bit later today. Um, so <clears throat> I point my fingers along V, and I have to orient my palm so that I can slap V all the way into V. So pretty long slap here, V into V. Okay, it's almost 180 degrees, right? So remember to do it with the palm of your hand, V slapped into B, so the force will be into the page. And again, if you find that challenging, I'll show you there's a shortcut uh, very uh, even later today. So the magnetic force on this particle is going to be into the page. And so if this charge is sitting at the top of the ring, it will not stay there for long. It will be deflected such that it goes onto the back side. So it'll kind of go like this. It'll flow onto the back side, right? Let's do it again for the charge at the very bottom. And I'm basically just cherry picking the ones that are going to be easiest to look at. B goes like this, and I have to orient my palm so I can push B into B, which is a long slap. It's almost almost 180 degrees, the force is out. So the force on this one will be out of the page. And so if that's the charge carrier that's sitting at the very bottom of the ring, it won't stay there for long. It'll pull out of the page, which means onto the front of this thing. And we notice something interesting is that both of these deflections actually agree that the charge should be moving in a certain circular direction on the ring. It's the current actually starts to flow on the ring. So what we have here is that, to summarize, we move the ring, and then the magnetic field deflects the charges and, by the way, What's the motion of this, uh, these charges ultimately going to be? Well, they're circling, circulating around the ring, and the ring is also moving forward. So what is the ultimate path of this, these charges? It's just a helix. It just happens to be going on inside a ring. Okay? So it deflects charges. They actually form a helix from your perspective. But if we're just talking about what's going on inside the ring and not worried about the ring moving forward as well, we might say this causes an induced current.
So the reason why we call it induced is, of course, we didn't create this current with a battery. We connected it by waving this conducting ring in the region of a magnet. So we somehow induced it to flow just by moving the ring here in a magnetic field. So here, the induced current is not zero, whereas over here, of course, it was. So nothing too remarkable about that. We're just putting magnetic deflection for good use. Okay? We're using this idea that when charges move, they, the magnetic field can deflect them into a helix, and we're usually using that to generate a current. So um, let me set this up for you. You can actually see it. Here's what I have. Here's my ring. It's actually not just one ring, but as usual, um, we put a bunch of ring, put a bunch of turns just to exaggerate the effect. Okay. And how am I going to tell if there's a current in there? Well, I literally have this connected up to this big giant ammeter, which, by the way, I brought in that one that my students had made. This is just a slightly more kind of professional version, but you can see here there's a current loop, and there's a big needle attached to it. So what we get to, uh, this will deflect um, if we can get some current going in there. Now the difference here is, of course, there is no source of current except I'm going to make the current by introducing a magnet. So let me bring in this magnet. It's a very powerful magnet. Okay. It's powerful rare earth magnet. I've made it even more powerful by taping light poles together, which is a very dangerous thing because light poles really don't like to be together. But I've taped the north and the north together to make a super north, and a south and a south together to make a super south. Okay? So it's a powerful bar magnet. And so what I'm going to do is exactly this. I'm going to have the bar magnet. I have my ring, or in this case really a bunch of rings. And the way I'm going to tell if this induced current is there or not is you can see the needle move from zero on the ammeter. Now, first things first, um, let me just put the magnet in there. It's a powerful magnetic field in there, but you see no current, right? And the reason why is that no matter how powerful the magnetic field, it can't just pick up charges from rest. It's deflective only. So what we need to do is we need to uh, move the ring relative to the magnet. So let's try that. Um, so you should see that the needle moves. Oh, look, this looks not quite zero, so let me zero it. Okay. And you should see, I'm going to do this, I'm going to move the ring away and towards the magnet, and during the time that it's moving, we're going to see that the magnetic field is able to deflect charges into a current. So watch the needle. Significant, right? In fact, it, I hit the very end of it, so it kind of bounced. So, right? You can see when there's motion, we get a current, right? It takes a while to settle back down. This doesn't have very good damping. But whenever there's the loop is moved towards or away from the magnet, we can deflect the charges into a current. Okay, so no big deal. Well, the final step, what if I reversed who is moving and I do this instead? I have that the ring itself is stationary, but I move the magnet. have arrived at a little bit of a situation. Because to us, the charges in this ring are at rest. And we've learned that if a charge is at rest, the magnetic field can't deflect it, right? There's nothing to deflect. 
right? So the, by that logic, the induced current should be zero. And yet, in another way, you might say, does it really matter if it's the ring moving towards the magnet or the magnet moving towards the ring? Common sense should dictate, right, that it should, that as long as they're moving relative to each other, you should get this induced current, right? So, let's try it. Go to the, this thing, and I'll move the magnet instead. And of course, we do get that while the magnet's in motion, we get an induced current. So, we appeal to this idea that all motion is relative. That, by the way, was what Einstein developed into his theory of relativity. And, of course, we get an induced current that is not zero here, too. <coughs> but then we're left with the uncomfortable notion of what is the flaw in our equations, because the magnetic force here should be zero, because the charges are at rest. It's deflective only. So we're only left with one type of field. What's the kind of field that can pick up charges from rest? Electric field. So we suddenly create an electric field. So this is an electric force that picks up the charges from rest. picks up charges from rest, and that is in fact what causes the induced current. And by the way, it'll be exactly the same direction as it was in the previous example. I induced flows like that. So hopefully you see that this simple demonstration is meant for us to reckon with the fact that there is a huge amount of intertwinedness between electricity and magnetism. And which type of field you see is really just a matter of your perspective. In this particular situation, our explanation for why the current flows is magnetic force. In this one, our explanation is electric force. And all the difference is, is which one we imagine moving and which one we imagine staying at rest, and yet we're forced to come up with different conclusions. In this one, it's purely magnetic. There is no need to invoke anything unusual. But here, we have to seemingly out of nowhere, it's an electric field that will pick up these charges from rest. So, what's going on here? Here's how I would characterize it. We said that charges create electric fields. That was the starting point, first couple lectures of the class. Then we said moving charges create magnetic fields, so charges that we think are moving. And then finally, to kind of close out the circle of logic, I'm going to say that quote unquote moving magnetic fields create electric fields. So you can see that one kind of begets the other, or one, in, when you think it's one thing in one perspective, it's the other in somebody else's perspective. So this last kind of hub of the wheel, this right here, will basically be what homework number seven is all about is to explore this relationship. And I should characterize this a little bit. We won't really call it moving magnetic field. In fact, moving magnetic fields is a little bit of a weird term. That's why I put it in quotes. A better way to think of it would be time evolving. right? So the magnetic field experienced by this ring will change with time if you start waving the magnet. Okay, so. Uh, it's basically, a better way to think of it would be a magnetic field that changes with time. It turns out that there are 
you can even relax the restriction more from there. Anytime there's a uh, magnetic flux that evolves with time, evolves with time. And of course, what the heck flux is, is something that we need to discuss. So that'll be one of the things that is definitely pretty uh, immediately on our plate. Um, and then the other thing is that while this does create an electric field, um, rather than talking about the field picture, we've of course learned that the um, voltage picture is oftentimes a lot easier to use. So instead we'll characterize this as an EMF. So for instance, when you guys did circuits, right, the EMF was the voltage of the battery, right? So you connected a battery up to things and it caused current to flow. But we're going to have circuits where there's current that flows and yet no battery in sight. The thing that drives that current is not a battery, it's a changing magnetic flux. So we're going to be able to cause current to seemingly flow out of nowhere by changing this thing called magnetic flux. It's another way to generate electricity. So the thing that connects these two, and notice that this does collect, connect, collect or sorry, connect electricity and magnetism. Elect, the uh, EMF is an electric thing, and the magnetic flux is a magnetic thing. The thing that connects these two is called Faraday's law. And that is basically the major I should actually, I should say, this is basically the single equation that will be featured on homework seven. Of course, you can flip it around a bunch of different ways, and I'll show you all that. Um, that's going to be our law for connecting electricity and magnetism. The only thing we have to get out of the way first is I want to show you some trick for getting the directions. Now, these long slap rules that we did here, obviously, that those were challenging. And here it's even unclear how to, you would execute a slap rule because from our perspective these charges are at rest, so there's no velocity to slap into anything. So I want to show you a rule of thumb that will get you the right answers. It'll be a lot easier and broader way to get the right answers for what happens with the current. Okay? So this new induced current, how do you get the direction of it? Then Faraday's law is what we'll pick up next, which will allow us to figure out how big is that current. Okay. So, um, are there any questions before I move forward? Okay, so um, let me uh, show you this rule of thumb. This is called uh, Lenz's Law. So Lenz's law is basically a way to find the direction of the induced current. And the best way I would describe Lenz's law, it's a status quo law. So if you don't know what status quo means, what that means is trying to keep things the same. Okay? So this law, the way to remember how it works is that it wants to keep things from changing. It doesn't want things to increase, it doesn't want things to decrease, it just wants things the way they already are. Okay? So here's the way to think of it. Um, it fights all change. So let's say, for instance, I had a V external that was like that, and this was constant in time. So constant in time. So there's nothing that changes about that. And so Lenz's law is happy. It says, OK, that's fine. And so what happens is, there is no induced current. I guess I'll put it over here. 
So there's nothing to fight if there's nothing that's trying to change. However, let's say, for instance, that the external points like this, and it's increasing in time. Well then, Lenz's law kicks in and says, I would prefer that you didn't increase. And so now, the induced current is not zero. It's going to fight that change. Now, how is it going to fight that change? Well, let me remind you that whenever you have an induced current, that will make its own magnetic field, right? If I have a, magnetic, uh, if I have a current that flows like this, that makes a magnetic field through the core like this, right? So here, what's going to happen is that B induced, that magnetic field made by the I induced, is going to point opposite like this. So it wants to fight the change. And what you can do is you can infer what does the direction of I induced have to be to make that. Okay. So that's the, the part that everyone seems to be able to remember. But remember that it's not going to be opposite just to be opposite. It's opposite because this is increasing. If this was constant in time, there wouldn't be anything to fight. And likewise, if V external is like this, but it's decreasing, again, I induced is not going to be 0 because there's some change to fight. But now, it doesn't like decreases either. So now the B induced is going to be in the same direction. So it's not always opposite. Sometimes it's zero and sometimes it's with the external field. It's whatever would most fight the change. So it tries to fight increases by opposing them, going opposite to that, but it also tries to prevent decreases by putting a magnetic field back in the original direction. See, it's a status quo law, right? It doesn't allow things to change. Does that make sense? So anytime that you try to do something with the external field, B induced will fight that change, and you can work backwards to what I induced must be to make that be induced. So for instance, if you go over here, of course, there is no change to fight, because the magnetic field that this ring feels is constant in time. I'm not saying it's uniform. The magnetic field over here might be weaker than over here or something. But it's not, it's not changing with time. So that's why nothing flowed here. I'll clear that one off. Um, I guess let me copy this one since this is uh, a uh, it, that was already pretty cluttered. So let me move the uh, the magnet toward the ring. So this is my B external. So. As far as the ring is concerned, that is the, um, the magnetic field that it's exposed to from outside. So as far as the ring is concerned, if you bring the magnet closer, is the B external going to increase or decrease with time? Increase, right? This is going to increase with time. You're bringing the magnet closer. So you're going to expose the ring to a stronger field. OK, so if we go over here, uh, which way does B induced want to point to fight that change? The left. So B induced wants to point like this. And then we use our right hand rule, working backwards, right? Current is going to flow like this if the B induced through the middle is going to go like that, right? So I induced points like that. So we've just figured out, in a much shorter way, not having to do these awkward slaps, although I will point out it's the same direction we found before, right? 
that's the same as this and the same as this, okay? So it's a lot easier. All right? So uh, now that I've shown you that it does produce the same answer, let's delete these guys and move forward. One of the things we might do, of course, is to make sure we can uh, do this, is try the other case. Let's say we have that the bar magnet is moved away. So instead of pushing the magnet towards, we pull the magnet away. So the magnetic field is like this. Of course, the magnetic field lines leave the North Pole, so the magnetic field that is external to the ring is still pointing generally in the rightward direction. But now, of course, if we pull the magnet away, what happens to the strength of that field is felt by the ring. It's decreased. So if it's decreased, which is the direction of B induced? The same way, right? It wants to not allow that decrease, so the current's going to pull like this. So now the current reverses direction, so that B induced can reverse direction. So that now it's trying to prevent the decrease instead of trying to prevent the increase. So that's my claim for what happens. The induced current will flow around opposite directions depending on whether I bring the magnet <coughs> closer or further away. So I'm going to now show you this. I have a ring just like these. I can untangle them. I don't know what happened here. There we go. So I have this ring. And one of the things you may notice is, of course, there is no ammeter in sight. So you may, the question is, how am I going to convince you that, one, there is current flowing in there at all, and number two, that it is in the direction that I've advertised? Well, there will always be some kind of macroscopic, see with your own eyes manifestation of Lenz's Law. You don't need an ammeter. You can just look at it and see. So Lenz's law often, or most of the time, most of the time has a see with your own eyes thing that you can do. Let me show you what it is in this case. This is where we can remember that if we cause a current to flow around, then we've essentially made that look like a magnet, right? So if the magnetic field induced comes out of here and then goes back in here, well, this is the North Pole and this is the South Pole. As long as there is current flowing in that ring, it will have magnetic poles. Remember, the magnetic pole uh, north is where the magnetic field lines come out, and south is where they go back in. So I'm not going to need an ammeter for this. If I try to bring this magnet closer, this simulates a magnet where the north is on the left and the south is on the right. What's going to happen with this north and north? They're going to repel. So there's literally a see with your own eyes. This ring does not want this magnetic field to come in. And it will literally move away when you try to bring it closer. All right? So let's go over here. Well, now the current's going the other way. The magnetic field's uh, induced is pointing, coming out of the right side. And so this is going to be our north pole, our virtual north pole. And this is going to be our virtual south pole. So clearly, this object is not a permanent magnet because if you switch the current direction in it, you'll switch the magnetic poles. Now, if I try to pull this away, the north and the south are closest to each other. What's going to happen there? It's going to attract. That's how I'm going to know that everything is as advertised. 
So if I go over to this ring, first of all, let me try to convince you that it is not magnetic material. It's not inherently magnetic. So this base is, this is a powerful magnet, but this is not, okay? There's nothing inherently magnetic, it's not magnetic material, but it becomes a magnet when I induce a current in it. And so what you're looking for is when I shove the magnet toward it, the induced current will have it have some temporary magnetic poles that repel it. So it's Lenz's law in action. So watch carefully here. Can I move away? Okay, I'll try it again. It's a subtle effect. But when I put the magnet in there, for the duration of the magnet moving, this will have an induced current and it will repel. So you should see it move away when I put the magnet in there. Yes? Okay. So let's try the opposite. When I try to pull it out, it should attract. So let's try it. It attracts, right? So think of it like this, right? As I'm putting this magnet in, the induced current flows like this, and the magnetic field comes out like this, so it creates a north pole on this side. But when I try to pull it out, the induced current flows this way, and the, and the EB induced points to the right, and the north pole is on this side, right? So you, there's a see with your own eyes, it doesn't like to change flux, right? It doesn't want to allow this magnet to get closer, but once the magnet gets closer, it doesn't like to have it go away. So I can get a pretty good swing going on here, because of course, this thing wants to repel when I'm bringing it towards it. Oh, didn't mean to touch it. Right? And I can pull it. When I pull it away, it, it tracks. Okay? So the best analogy I can give for this, if you've ever been in one of those uh, dysfunctional relationships, right? Stay away, no, don't go. Stay away, no, don't go. Right? Status quo. Nothing ever seems to change. Okay? I can also try this other ring, which is seemingly exactly identical. Oh. I can get it off there. I'll try with this one. Nothing happens. The reason why is it literally has a little break in it. So current can't flow because current can't circulate all the way around. See that? So it literally is just current flowing around the perimeter of the ring. And which way it flows will depend on whether or not I'm bringing the magnet closer, doesn't like that, or I'm trying to take the magnet away, doesn't like that. It's a status quo law. So, um, let me try it uh, with uh, something besides a bar magnet. Um, let me try it with this thing. So this is an electromagnet instead. So here's what we have. There's a solenoid here. So of course we learned that a solenoid can create a um, large magnetic field in its interior. And if you're neck close to the uh, front of it, it will still be pretty strong. And it also has this magnetic material. And of course what we learned is that if you apply a magnetic field, and you send current around the solenoid, that's going to create a magnetic field like that through the core, and that's going to actually magnetize this material, and its magnetic field will get added on top, right? So this is just basically a way to suddenly, from no magnetic field, generate a large magnetic field if I just turn on the current. Um, so let me put a conducting ring here um, on this thing, and uh, I'm going to turn on the uh, magnetic field very rapidly, um, and we should see some repulsion. So this thing is called a ring launcher, for obvious reasons. Um, another way that you may have heard of this uh, being put to use is something called a rail gun. So this idea that this thing really doesn't like to change, 
uh, the magnetic field it experiences, so it will create magnetic poles to repel. I can try this with various things. Let's try, let's try to compare this one, so I'll get a sense of how high that flies. Okay, that touched the ceiling beam. Let's try this one. Doesn't go nearly as high, even though it's actually um, less weight. Um, the reason why is because if you want to carry a lot of current, you have to have very little resistance. So we learned that one of the things that determines resistance is cross-sectional area, right? This one is a nice five-lane highway going around like this. It's nice and wide, whereas this one is a much more narrow path. And so current has a harder time flowing in it. And if there's less current, less high induced, these magnetic poles won't be as strong either, right? Uh, I can try other stuff. Um, let's throw in this one. It has a break in it. It's not going to work at all. Can't carry an induced current. Try this one. Nothing happens. This is pretty much a very high insulator, so it doesn't matter that it's contiguous because its resistivity is so high, right? I can try, what else? I can try this one. This is, a, this is a current loop that has a light bulb attached. So I can make, make the light bulb light up, okay? There's no battery in here. All I did was take the induced current and have it do the thing that we normally have it do, have it flow through a light bulb, right? So that's another way to light up a light bulb is Instead of attaching it to a battery, we just do something with the magnetic field nearby, right? Right? So, um, there is some fun with the ring launcher. Um, any questions on that? Okay. Um, so, that's uh, Lenz's Law in a nutshell. And it's something that's a really nice thing to hold on to as we start to move in to uh, Faraday's law because it's a really easy way to just think through what is the induced current direction going to be. The induced current's going to flow such as to fight changes. If there are no time evolved, there's nothing changing in time, there's nothing to fight. But if the magnetic field tries to increase, it'll go against it. And if it tries to decrease, it'll go with it. Um, I should mention that homework number seven, um, I think the whole first half of it is just Lenz's Law stuff. Okay, so no calculations of any kind, just using Lenz's Law to figure out does the induced current flow this way or that way. So you just, I want you to really get some practice doing this. You'll also get some practice doing this uh, in your lab on Faraday's Law, where you'll use Lenz's Law a bit as well. Okay, um, any questions? Before I move forward. All right, so let's go ahead and now talk about Faraday's Law. So Faraday's Law I'll just go ahead and write it down first. this. Now, obviously, a, uh, some new stuff going on in there, but I do want to point out that on the left-hand side, there's your EMF. That EMF is every bit as real as the EMF made from a battery, but it's not an EMF made from a battery. This electrical phenomenon is due to the fact that over here we have magnetic flux changing with time. So there you see the connection between electricity on the left and magnetic stuff on the right. So we already said there had to be some evolving with time, so it's reassuring to see time in there. And then, of course, this new quantity is called magnetic flux. So. Obviously, before we can even crack this law, we have to talk about what's magnetic flux, then we can come back to understand this law. Uh, but before I even do that, I want to point out that once you have this EMF, 
go ahead and just use Ohm's law to connect that EMF to the induced current that will flow. So once you have a certain EMF, you also have to consider if you have a smaller or big resistance before you know how much the induced current will be, right? So if you get a certain amount of EMF, but it's through a highly resistive thing, you'll get barely any current. And vice versa, if you, you'll get a lot of current if your resistance is very small. So of course, that's why we saw the uh, metal rings jump so high off the ring launcher and the uh, rings with brakes and uh, highly insulating things, not really much at all. Okay. So we have use for our good old Ohm's law, like usual, but we, of course, um, the EMF is from a completely alien source. And the reason why there's absolute value signs here is that we really just use this to get the amount or size of the EMF. The direction is going to be Lenz's law. Lenz's law you're going to use to get the direction of the induced current. So in a certain sense, Lenz's law is really just part of Faraday's law. Okay. So Lenz's law helps you get the direction for Faraday's law, and Faraday's law, as we call it, is really just helping us calculate the actual amount of current. Okay. Okay. Um, so let's go ahead and learn about flux. What's flux all about? Magnetic flux. So the best way I can talk about magnetic flux, and again, this is the best analogy I can give you, um, it's kind of like how much magnetic field is quote unquote caught, or a better word, or counted across a particular area. So the way to think of this is that instead of talking about that what the magnetic field is everywhere, we're going to have a particular area, kind of like a net, so to speak. So we can talk about the amount of uh, things that we, uh, amount of magnetic field passing through that area. So let's go ahead and put in our magnetic field. Let's say it looks like this. And we'll go ahead and we'll put in uh, some kind of catcher. Let me imagine kind of like a hula hoop looking thing, like this, of cross-sectional area A. So you can kind of imagine it like this. We kind of have something that's pointed like this. We have, if we do that, we're going to have the magnetic field piercing through that as much as possible. The kind of the analogy would be, instead of magnetic field, let's talk about fish. Okay? And we had fish that were all swimming in this direction. So maybe some, you know, salmon or something that are all going in the same direction. If you wanted to catch the most fish, you of course put your net with the opening like this. I don't want to draw the net on the back side. Um, so a better way than saying we have to catch them, let's just count them. So let's say we're you know just wildlife biologists, right? We just want to count the fish, right? We want to have measure the fish flux, okay? And inherently, how are you going to do that? You're not going to be able to count every one. You're going to have to sample that with a certain catcher, right? So this will be some kind of ring where when the fish swim through and they get counted, okay? So how might we do this? We would here, we take the number of fish, but then we'd of course have to acknowledge the fact that the number of fish we're going to count 
is also not just due to the health of the fish population, but how big is your catcher? Obviously, if you have a big ring, more fish are going to swim through it. If you have a smaller ring, less fish are going to swim through it. So a better way to measure would be the total number of fish times the area of your catcher. That would be like your fish flux, OK? B sub fish, OK? So there are two ways that you can count more fish flux. One is if the fish population was healthier, so there were more fish swimming through. And the other one is that you, of course, the fish population is poor, but you happen to have a gigantic catcher, so therefore you get a lot of fish flux, right? That's the same thing I'm going to do over here. It's going to be the strength of the magnetic field itself times the area of my catcher. So this right here, this is already pretty much the deal, the deal with magnetic flux. It's enough to get the units of it. The units of flux are going to be the units of field times area. What's the SI unit for magnetic field again? Does anyone remember? Tesla. And then area, we would usually in SI units measure in square meters. So the units of magnetic flux are Tesla meters squared. This is a, com, comes up often enough that it's sometimes called a Weber, although I generally don't bother too much. You can define this kind of flux, by the way, with any type of field. You can do a electric flux. You can do gravitational field flux. Any, it doesn't matter. It's just a way of counting field. And it's a way of recognizing that what you catch will not only be a function of how strong is the field, but how big is your catcher. Okay. So, let's talk about when might you not get any flux. Well, let's say you put your ring like this, and you're trying to get fish to swim through it. Well, you're not going to get any fish if the fish are swimming to the right. You'll get fish that swim above it, and some of the fish that swim below it, but none of them are actually going to pass through the loop itself, right? So, you'll get no flux. Because the fish will not swim through it. They'll swim above it, they'll swim below it, but nobody swims through it because the loop is not oriented correctly. Does that make sense? That's the same thing with magnetic flux. If we orient our loop like this, our flux is zero. So we go from a maximum flux, when we have our catcher set up correctly, or our counter, and we go to zero flux when it's oriented all wrong. So, of course, there's an intermediate ground, right? You could have it tilted, but not tilted totally wrong. So we can take care of that possibility. That might look something like this. It might be tilted off a little bit like that. So, as you can probably guess, we're going to have to characterize the angle in some way. What angle does it make? Um, the way we characterize the angle is we're dropping what's called a normal line. So we drop in a line that's perpendicular to the plane of, that the loop is in. This is not to be confused with normal vector. Normal vector requires that there be a current flow, right? So then we can wrap our fingers around that and make an unequivocal arrow for the, the uh, normal vector. Here, we don't even know if there's any current in this loop. So um, we, that's the best we can do. We can set up a line that is uh, um, perpendicular to the plane. I can draw it in over here for this one. I can draw it in over here for this one. I can do it, I guess, for my fish flux, too. Here's my normal line, here's my normal line. And then all we do is we measure the angle between that normal line and the field. So you can measure it here if you want, or you can measure it here if you want. 
That will be our what we call theta. <coughs> And then our formula ends up being B A cosine of theta. And again, I'm not going to belabor why it's cosine, but I'm just going to show you that it makes perfect sense when you try the various values. This angle is between the normal line and the magnetic field. And by the way, since this is a line and not an arrow, the range of this angle can be from 0 to 90, not 180. Because one of them doesn't have an arrowhead, so there's no difference between pointing opposite versus pointing the same way, right? So when two things both have an arrow, they could be pointing 180 or 0, but if one of them is a line, then 90 is where you cap out. So let me try it here. Um, for this one right here, um, this was what we said was the maximum flux. What is the arrow, or sorry, what is the angle between the normal line and the magnetic field? Zero. Okay. So theta would be zero for this one. What's cosine of zero? One. One. So this is indeed the max flux that checks out. There we have oriented it with the normal line and magnetic field to get maximum flux. What's the angle between the normal line and the magnetic field here? What is it? 90. 90. So theta is 90. So what's cosine of 90? Zero. So that's the minimum flux. There is when the orientation is all wrong to catch anything. And of course, in general, we can have some any angle between 0 and 90 as well. So if we tilt it a little bit like this, we won't catch as much flux as maximum, but it won't yet be zero. In the analogy over here, if you tilted this like that, you'd still get a few fish swimming through it, but not as many, right? Does that make sense? OK. Uh, and then one more refinement. As always, we are going to accentuate the effect by not just having a single loop, but a whole stack of them, right? So this will be the number of loops. If you have 10 loops all oriented exactly the same way, catching the same fields, same area, you'll catch 10 times the flux as you would if there was just one, right? That would be of questionable usefulness for a wildlife biologist if they had a whole tube full of these, because of course, one fish would have to swim through all of those and therefore uh, would get double, triple, quadruple counted. But that's actually going to be to our advantage when we start talking about uh, magnetism and generating electricity because we get this multiplier effect. We get this basically being able to use the magnetic field multiple times. Right? So that's our master formula for flux right here. And the ingredients that we originally started with, B and A, determine the units. The other stuff is not going to introduce any other units, right? N is just the number of loops. That's just a, a number. And then, of course, cosine of theta is uh, not is unitless as well. All right. So that sets us up to calculate flux. I think there might be one or two problems on your homework where all you have to do is calculate the flux, but it's at this point, kind of a dead end, what are we going to do with it? Of course, if you change the flux with time, you get EMF. So what, we're, what are we going to do? We're going to take turns changing each of these four factors. And if I change any of those four factors, not just the magnetic field strength, of course, that's what we've been talking about mostly so far, right? Changing the actual strength of the magnetic field with time. When I was waving that magnet near that ring, I was changing the magnetic field strength felt by the ring. But that's just one of four different ways to change the flux. So if n, b, a, and or theta change with time, I will get 
get an EMF. It's important they change with time. But if one or more of the ingredients that makes up the flux changes with time, then the flux will change with time and I will get an EMF. Now, I'll tell you right now, for our purposes, I'm not going to have you change more than one thing at one time, so for us, it's more one of these four, not multiple ones. Here's the order I'm going to do them in. First, I'll just do the familiar thing. I'll, start, I'll change the magnetic field with time. Then, I will change the area with time. So one of the ways that I can change my magnetic flux is simply by changing the size of the catcher. So not the magnetic field itself, but make the catcher bigger or smaller, and the flux will change because of that. Then I'll change the angle. And by the way, this will be an electric generator. That's how electricity is generated. So we'll take a look at how is it that the electricity that comes out of your wall, how is it made? Then factor number four will be something to do with the number of loops. Now the number of loops is hard to manipulate over time, suddenly increasing or decreasing the amount of loops. So we're not going to be changing that for, for time per se, but there's still something interesting we can do with this, and that's something called electric transformer. So you can change the electricity or transform it in some way. For instance, if you have one of those black power cubes, right? Lots of devices use those power cubes those that you plug in the wall. What's inside there? It's a transformer. So we're going to talk about why that works and why that's really important for the technology of electricity. So that's kind of where we're going with this. And once we have finished going through these cases, That'll close out homework seven and exam two. Right. Um, so, are there any questions before I start on the first one? All right, let's go for it. Let's see how far we can get today with it. Here's going to be my example. So this is my example of B changing with time. All right. So let's put in my magnetic field. I'll say it points into the page. So that's my B external. And B external, it is going to be uniform, which means that it's the same at any given moment, it's the same everywhere in space. So that means same in space. So one point of space, there isn't a stronger field than another point and if you look at any given moment. However, it is going to be growing in time. So what you have to imagine is that these lines are all uniformly, these lines are all going to get more bunched up over time, still having equal spacing at any moment, but getting closer and closer with time. Um, and let me give you the rate of that growth. It's going to grow at five Teslas per second. So I have a changing magnetic field. Okay, so make sure you understand that uniform that how something can be uniform, which means it's the same everywhere in space, but growing in time. So let me put in my catcher. I'm going to put in a conducting ring that's going to be circular. It's going to have a radius. Um, and I'm going to call the, lower, the radius lowercase r, even though I've usually used uppercase r. That will be one meter, and the reason why I'm using lowercase r is because uppercase r is going to be the resistance of the ring. It's going to be 10 ohms. Okay. 
Okay? And here is my question. First, A, what is the direction of I induced? And B, what is its size? Those will be the kind of formal parts of this problem, and then I might tack on a part C where I just kind of pontificate about various things in a more unstructured way. All right, All right so let's try it. First, let's get the direction of I induced. That's what Lenz's law is about. Okay? So Lenz's law wants to fight change. So B external passing through this loop is into the page and growing, so which way is B induced want to point? Out, right? It's not out just because B external is in, it's out because B external is inward and growing, right? That's why it fights that. So we go ahead and we say B induced is out of the page, and if B induced is out of the page, which way is the current flow? Lenz's law, and now we can use Faraday's law to help us with uh, finding the amount. So let's try it. Um, first of all, just to make our lives easier, we have one loop, right, so we don't have to worry about that. And uh, what beta should we use for our flux calculation? What's the angle between the normal line and the magnetic field? Zero. zero. That is zero, cosine and theta is one. We have oriented this loop to catch maximum flux. Right? The normal line runs like this, and that's the same direction as the B external. Okay? So with that, our flux reduces to just B times A, right? Size of the magnetic field times the area of the catcher. Let's put it into the equation. Now one of the things that you may not remember about delta math is that if anything that is in the delta is not actually delta in, you take it out of the delta. Okay? So if you have delta B times A, that means B final, A final, minus B initial, A initial, right? Well, A isn't changing, right? So, we can just factor that out. So that becomes A times delta B. So again, if something inside the delta is not actually changing, you can just take it out. So here's what we have. Our EMF is going to be A times delta B over delta T. All right. So what's the area of this catcher? How would I calculate that? Where is it? Area of the circle. Area circle, which is what? Pi R squared. Pi R squared, that's right. So EMF is going to be pi r squared, and then this is where you think, well, how am I going to change the calculate the delta b if I don't have b final or b initial? Sometimes they give you b final, b initial, and you subtract them, and you divide by the time it takes to make that change. Well, in this case, we have handed to us on a silver platter what is the rate of change of b over time? We just it's just this number, right? So this number is just five Teslas per second. We were just handed that whole thing. The rate of change in the magnetic field is five Teslas per second. Then we put in the radius. The radius, of course, is one meter. And you basically get, what, 15 pi here, or, or five pi, so it's around 15 volts. Round it off. So we get that the result of this magnetic field changing in this region is the exact same result on the loop as if I had connected a 15 volt battery to it. But I didn't connect a 15 volt battery to it. I created this EMF by a changing magnetic flux. 
So now all I have to do is apply my Ohm's law. So I said that equal to I times R. I was told I had a, radi uh, a, sorry, a resistance of 10 ohms. And if I divide by 10, I get the induced current is 1.5 amps. So I already knew the direction of it. Now I know how many amps it is. All right. So that would be an example of how to calculate with Faraday's law. <coughs> so only be, out of the four ingredients that go into flux, N, theta, B, and A, there will only be one thing that's inside the delta. There's only be one thing that's left. Everything else is going to be on the outside. Every, there's going to be one thing that changed with time, and you figure that out, and, and then calculate the amount. Now, as far as part C, other things that you might uh, want to talk about, uh, you might want to talk about what's B net. Uh, at the center of the loop or something like that. Well, uh, B net at the center of the loop in this case would be, of course, uh, B external minus B induced, right? If you're trying to fight the change, then B induced is going to try to take a little bit off of B external. How might you calculate this? If I were to give you this in a more structured way, well, of course, here you use mu naught i over uh, n mu naught i over 2r. That's the formula that you hopefully remember from our homework 6 discussion for how to calculate the magnetic field in the center of a circular loop. Here, of course, I just have one loop, so I only need one turn. And be careful, this capital R is the radius, so you would put in one meter for that. That's not the resistance. Okay? So the B induced is made by I induced. Now keep in mind that B external is increasing, while B induced is actually going to be constant. And the reason why is because, of course, B induced is tied to the rate of change. And since this rate is constant, then that's why I induced and B induced are constant. So that reason alone, the net field is not going to be zero. So while Lenz's law is handy for trying to fight the flux change, it generally is not successful in doing that, right? It tries to fight the flux change, but the net field in the interior will grow, right? In general, B induced will be a minor uh, effect on B external, except one exception. There's one exception where if your resistance of your loop goes to zero, which is what we call a superconductor, then if you look at I induced is EMF over R, that lets I induced grow to whatever value it wants. Now, here is the breakdown in our formula as the current doesn't really go to infinity. But what the current can always do is grow until it cancels the external. Then it doesn't have any reason to grow anymore. Because if I induced can create a B induced that cancels the external, well then there's nothing left to do. This is called perfect <coughs> magnetic shielding. So we can shield the interior of the ring from any external magnetic fields, but you have to have not an everyday amount of thing lying around. You have to have a superconductor to do that. Okay? Generally, magnetic field shielding is much harder to do than electric shielding. Uh, it requires something where the current is able to grow to whatever value is necessary. Okay, so let's call it a day there, and we'll pick up more next time.